dear Jim, it is really, really a pleasure for us, the Romanian community, to have you here. Uh, thank you very much for coming. My pleasure. I'm looking forward to this. If you can tell us a little bit about the history of this book. When did you come up with this idea? How did you build the book? And when it all came, let's say. Yeah, thank you, Christian. Well, the book, I actually first started writing it. It's, it's in its, even in English, it's now in its second edition and, uh, of course, being translated into other languages. But I first started writing the book back in the 90s. Um, I, I began, because I'm, I'm an academic physicist, my, my uh, specialism is in fact not cosmology in the very large, my PhD was in nuclear physics, so I study the very small particles, not, not the largest uh, cosmos, but in, in the mid-1990s I became very uh, passionate and interested in science communication, and I was delivering a series of lectures to high school students um, and uh, trying to think of what would be the most exciting uh, topic to, to, to talk to them about, I decided obviously you have to talk about the universe, relativity, black holes, time travel. So I began giving this lecture to students and then eventually I realized I had gathered so much information and maybe some nice ways of explaining, some analogies, I approached the Institute of Physics in the, in the UK. So this is the professional um, uh, body organization for, for physicists in, in Britain. Um, and I said, I would like to, 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 uh, to write this popular science book. I have all this material. So they the Institute of Physics commissioned me to write, write the book. So I was writing it in the late 90s and it was published in 1999. In fact, maybe we, we, we might even mention this when, uh, in the discussion. 1998 was a very uh, important year in astronomy uh, and, and, and cosmology. And uh, the book, I was writing it immediately after this big discovery. So it was all uh, you know, about the expansion of the universe. So it's a very exciting time in that field. So I yeah. continue with, with my own um, academic research in nuclear physics. But when popularizing physics, this was the subject I decided to write my first book on. This was my first book, by the way. Yeah, I will uh, continue on this line with the second question and I'll ask Gina to continue with her question because uh, just to make sure to the audience that doing nuclear physics on Earth here and studying some stars far, far away, it's basically the same thing because yeah. it's the same physics involved. Can you, can you elaborate on this and really explain mm. to the people that what we're doing here is relevant to what happens somewhere there in the stars? Yes, that's, that's a very good point because it's not so obvious uh, when you think about the building blocks of matter and then something that happens so far away. Um, a colleague of mine, uh, another nuclear physicist, uh, had this very, uh, um, very nice uh, uh, quote saying, he'd say, when you look up into the, the night sky, and you see everything you see on a clear night, almost everything you see is the result of a nuclear reaction. Wow. Because, <laughs> because that is what's happening inside stars. Stars shine because of nuclear processes happening inside them. So much of what we do in nuclear physics really has applications and answers questions in astrophysics. Understanding it's the processes inside stars requires an understanding of how the nuclei of atoms inside the stars interact and, and build up and, and react together. That's a very nice way of saying that means that when we look at the stars in the evening, we think about your nuclear physics. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. It's, it's also very good when, I'm, when we're trying to apply for the government for research money, for research grants. We say, we're not just doing nuclear physics. We want to understand how stars shine. And exactly, that yeah. sounds somehow you know, more, more exciting, more, more poetic. <laughs> yeah. So uh, actually, we have kind of two type of questions, which we receive from our uh, people who like you. Uh, some of them are technical and some of them are more general. So probably they will alternate. So Gina, would you like mm -hmm. to start with the first question? Yes, just uh, listening, uh, Jim, talking about the uh, nice um, way of uh, observing the sky during the night and uh, observing the um, uh, stars, sunshine, 
Um, one question which uh, is regarding uh, this uh, is regarding the sky, and uh, I like it very much the way uh, how you treat it in the book. Uh, and the question is why the night is dark. Ah, yes, <laughs> this is a this is a, a wonderful. It's it's uh, often called um, Olber's paradox after an uh, an astronomer many years ago, um, because we don't know how big the universe is. So very simply, we might imagine the universe to be infinite. So it just goes on forever. But this means that every direction you look in the sky, eventually you should see a star in that line of sight. And if that is true, then the sky should be full of stars. Or maybe we should say full of galaxies because we know now stars collect together in, 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 in galaxies. So why is the night sky dark? Why isn't it so bright, even brighter than the day? Because it's full of all the, well, of course, the day would also be very bright as well. It'd be full of stars and galaxies from every direction. And, and astronomers actually struggled to understand why this is the case. Why is it dark at night? Why do you not see stars in every point of the sky? And they tried several ways of understanding it. But actually, the answer is because the universe may be infinite in space, in size, but it's not infinite in age, in time. It had a beginning. And so um, a simple way of explaining this is to say, we can only see those stars and galaxies, the objects in the sky, which are close enough to us for their light to have had a chance to reach us. We know the universe is 13.8 billion years old. So since 13.8 billion years ago, or just a little bit less than that, when stars and galaxies began to form, the light from them has been traveling through the universe. So the most distant objects we can see are the ones whose light is just reaching us now. But any stars and galaxies further away we haven't seen them yet. In fact, there's another problem because the universe is expanding, we will never see them. <laughs> so exactly, yeah. so, so, so it, it's almost a very nice proof when someone says, how do you know the universe had a beginning? How do you know there was a big bang? Of course, there are many very strong scientific pieces of evidence, but you can say, well, because it gets dark at night, because if the universe didn't have a beginning, if it existed forever, the night sky would be as bright as day. And I, I, I think that's a very strong, strong argument uh, to, to, to explain to people that we, our universe had a beginning. Yeah, that's, an, that's a, a, a nice way of explaining, but there's also a poetic way. So when yes, you go yes. in the, at the night with your girlfriend or with your boyfriend and you want to say something romantic, you may say this story. <laughs> they, they may not like science. They may be very bored by it. So you have to, first of all, be careful that they will be fascinated by a scientific answer. <laughs> yeah, uh, I have uh, many people actually who are fascinated about black holes. And uh, some, some of my um, friends, one of them is Cosmin. He wants to ask you, uh, can black holes absorb dark matter? And can they emit dark matter? Well, what we know about dark matter, and uh, we know it exists, and we know it has a gravitational um, effect, we don't know what it's made of, the particles that make up dark matter, but it should therefore interact gravitationally in the same way as normal matter. And therefore, black holes should also be able to absorb to, to attract dark matter in the same way. Dark matter will also, we know it, has in Einstein's theory of relativity tells us that uh, matter and energy changes, affects the shape of space time. And, and a black hole is an example of where space time has been curved around in a very extreme way. Well, dark matter also causes space time to be curved and therefore dark matter would also be part of the, 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 um, the ingredients of a, of a black hole. But equally, a black hole doesn't allow normal matter to escape. It doesn't allow light to escape. We would therefore expect it not to allow any dark matter to escape. 
a black hole is closed off from the outside universe. No kind of matter could, could escape from it. Not even dark matter. Not even dark matter. <laughs> yes, Gina? Um, considering that we are at the chapter of uh, black holes, one simple question uh, might be, uh, as is, uh, it is written in the book, why uh, the black hole is black and why the black hole it has a hole? Yes, in, in, in a sense, uh, many of these names for these uh, astronomical objects are probably not the most appropriate. If we, with, if we knew everything that we know now, we would not call, we would not use the term dark matter, big bang, black hole, dark energy. We'd probably think of something a bit more precise. But anyway, we have these things called uh, black holes. Of course, they are black because they don't emit light or they don't even reflect light. They're, they're, they're black because light cannot escape them. The, the, they curve the space around them so much that no light could ever leave them if it falls within the, the event horizon, which is the, the, the boundary, the border, uh, the shell of, of the black hole. And it's a hole, I guess it's a hole because it's a, it's, it's a hole in gravity. It's a, it's a gravity well. Uh, it's, um, you know, in, on Earth, when, you, when you, uh, uh, a ball rolls down a hill, it'll go down, it'll fall in. If, if there's a hole in the ground, the ball can fall inside the hole. So gravity pulls things down. Well, a black hole is, is a hole in space, or more correctly, a hole in space-time. And so hole, a hole is probably quite a nice way of describing a region of our universe where you can throw things in, but they can never come out. And it's black because not even light can, can escape from it. Yes, uh, very nice explained. Going along that line, Dan, um, of course he knows, as you explained, that the black holes curve space but he wondered if space can exist without matter. Hmm. Yes, okay. actually, this is the question because yeah, yeah. Yeah, matter curves space. Yeah. But can you have space without matter? This, this is a lovely uh, philosophical question. Uh, in, in fact, many um, thinkers, uh, uh, philosophers and scientists have thought about it. In going all the way back to the ancient Greeks, you know, Aristotle uh, uh, believed that space has no existence without matter. Uh, you know, you, you need, uh, there's a nice example. If you have a, a, an empty box uh, filled you know, with a vacuum inside, so nothing inside the box. Um, does the space inside the box exist because of the walls of the box? What if you remove those walls of the box? Does the space still exist? Or did it only exist because it was defined by being the interior volume of the box? So Aristotle said, no, space can't exist without, uh, without matter. Newton had the opposite view. He said, you need space. That, that is the, 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 the theater, the arena, the, the stage where events take place. So you need space and then you can put matter, particles, stuff inside it. Of course, now, we think Einstein was right, which is somehow in the middle between those two views. Because when Einstein developed his general theory of relativity, you can think of his theory of relativity as an equation. An equation has an equals sign in the middle with something equaling something else. In Einstein's equation, on one side of the equal sign, you have space and time. On the other side, you have matter and energy. So matter and energy affects space and time, and space and time tells matter and energy how to move. But if one of them disappears, if, if matter and energy is zero, then space and time is also zero. If space and time is zero, matter and energy is zero. So they need each other. There is no space time without matter and energy. And of course, matter and energy need space time to, 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 to in it. There's a, there's a book by Einstein uh, that, that he wrote called The Theories of, of Special and General Relativity. He wrote it very soon after he developed his, his general theory of relativity, back in, you know, just after the First World War. First of all, of course, it was in German and then it translated into other languages. And many books 
such as such as mine, you you go through more recent editions. So you correct them and you add bits and you think, well, maybe this is not so true anymore. I should maybe, you know, rewrite it. Einstein didn't rewrite that book, but instead he added appendices to the end of the book. And the last appendix before, you know, one year before he died, in, so this was added in 1954, explains this exactly this point. He says that space time is the gravitational field produced by matter and energy. So without matter and energy, there is no gravitational field and therefore there can be no space time. So, so I like that, that argument that can space time exist without matter and energy? No, because they are two sides of an equation. Yes, Gina? Um, how gravity would affect the, um, uh, the time, uh, the horizon of a, uh, the black hole or uh, the gravity on Earth or uh, at the lower gravity? Yes, this is, this is the, one of the, the, the most fascinating aspects of, of Einstein's general theory of relativity, because, you know, we hear, you know, well, gravity, you know, it's an attractive force, it makes space bend, you sort of, you can maybe Im try to imagine that. But when you say gravity affects time, it's somehow different, because of course, Einstein says, first of all, you have space and time combined together. So you have four dimensional space time, then you bring in matter and energy in the gravitational field. Of course, it, it, it can't just affect space. It has to affect time as well. But for us, how do we um, experience that? And of course, we now know that gravity slows time down. So it makes time run at a slower rate. Um, I, it, if people have seen the, 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 the movie Interstellar, uh, Matthew McConaughey travels to, to, to orbit around this black hole and the gravitational field is so strong, his time is much slower. So for him, you know, one hour in that, uh, near the black hole is like years, many years on, on Earth. And this is wonderful. He comes back to Earth and his young daughter is now a very old lady and it's, it's, it's wonderful. But actually, gravity changes time here on Earth as well. I mean, you know, that's this is. I mean, it's a very good point you make because, of course, we have a, a very important application that makes use of this. We have GPS. Exactly. As, yeah. So you know, all of us we have. You know, here's my 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 smartphone. When I want to find my location, it sends signals to satellites, and they send the signals back to Earth, and that tells me where I am. But this only works if the clocks on board the satellites are counting the seconds the same rate at the same speed as clocks on at sea level on the surface of the earth. And the, unfortunately, because the satellites are in orbit around the earth, they feel a slightly weaker gravitational field because they're further away from the center of the earth. So the gravity is slightly weaker. So their clocks can, can, can count the time a little bit more quickly than clocks on earth. So we have to adjust for that. We have to make those clocks speed up a little bit to synchronize them with clocks on earth. Otherwise we wouldn't find our way. So again, it's a wonderful um, uh, example that, you know, how do you know that time slows down? Well, because you know we know we're right because if we ignored this, then we would never be able to find our way using GPS. We would, we would get very lost very quickly. <laughs> I was thinking that a nice way to remember this maybe is that when we are lying in the bed, you know, the time is slowing down rather than we stand. <laughs> yes, because we're closer to the to the center of the earth. <laughs> exactly. Yes, if if you want to, if you know, if you, time runs more slowly um, up on top of a mountain, uh, sorry, more quickly on top of a mountain because it's weaker gravity. So maybe you live longer at the bottom of the mountain, but maybe the healthy air at the top of the mountain is much more important. Uh, for sure, and the sure. effect of relativity. <laughs> yeah, exactly, for sure. I think that the times fly uh, because we are at the um, no no. Uh, uh, the half of, of our uh, discussion. And I was thinking to move a little bit uh, to the other questions, like more general life related. If you have Gina some more questions about physics, maybe you can uh, continue after this. So uh, I was wondering, there is a question, let me see who put the question. 
you're done put this question. Can you tell us how your passion for physics started? When did your passion for physics start? Um, probably when I was about 13 or 14 years old. Uh, I mean, at that time, I, I had the obvious passion. I wanted to be a professional footballer. I wanted to be a rock star, you know, the usual things. I was, I was learning to play the guitar. I was interested in girls. But I remember doing a test in school in physics. And uh, I did very well on that test. I mean, I, together with my friends, we were sort of, we were quite successful in the class and we were good in, in many subjects, but in physics, on this test, I was the only one who achieved a high mark. Uh, and my teacher, I, I should have been, I say, I should have been embarrassed, but I wasn't, I was quite proud. My teacher took me out in front of the class and said, see, Jim did very well on this test. Why didn't the rest of you try harder? I was thinking, okay, so I'm, I'm, I must be, I have, must have a talent for physics. But I realized also that the questions I had in, in my head, you know, does laying, as we're saying, laying at night, looking up at the night sky, imagining what are stars made of? Do they go on forever? What is the nature of time? These are, you know, big questions. I had no, there was no internet. I had no way of, nobody to ask. No, I couldn't find any books that would answer those questions. But I, un, I realized that physics was the subject I would have to study if I wanted to find answers to those questions. And I realized that actually, yes, physics is it's easier than chemistry and biology. Chemistry and biology, you have to remember things. <laughs> physics, you, you just have to, it's like logic. It's like solving a puzzle. So I, I found that much more enjoyable and much more easy to do. And from that moment, that was it. I was going to do physics. I, I cannot agree more. What I like Good. about <laughs> physics, is you learn some laws, you know, you learn, yeah. learn Maxwell laws. Yeah. That's what you, you, you need. And you apply them everywhere. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yes, Gina? Uh, I would like to address a question from Stefan. Uh, what makes you happy? Does physics make you happy? Among other things. Uh, I, I'm happy when my football team, Leeds United, win. Uh, I'm happy when I'm with my family. I'm happy, you know, if I have a nice glass of wine. But yes, I'm happy when uh, I, I understand something about the universe that I didn't understand before. Maybe I, I've solved some equation. Maybe one of my students has presented me with some result that they've solved some problem. That also makes me happy and proud. So, yeah. I'm, I'm, I get the most sense of excitement laying in bed at night when I have a physics problem that I'm trying to think through. And uh, so I always, I always say to my students, you know you have become a physicist when the problem you're thinking about is the last thing you think before you fall asleep and the first thing you think about when you wake up. That's when you know it's become part of you. <laughs> and that comes very close to the question Mihai has because he knows that you are a researcher. You don't only popularize science on BBC as we know it and on all the other channels back here in Romania, you have a really a world reach, but he knows that you are a researcher as well as you told us and you are thinking about your research in type. So he was wondering what kind of research do you do? Can you tell us more about your research and give us some examples mm. of the research you made? Yes, well, uh, as, as I started, I did my PhD in nuclear physics. So for many years, probably until about 10, 10 or so years, 10 or 15 years ago, the papers that I was publishing, the research I was doing was in nuclear physics. So I was trying to understand the structure of certain kinds of atomic nuclei and, and a, a nucleus of atoms made of particles, protons and neutrons. And you can use quantum mechanics, the, the, the theory of the, the microscopic world to describe the properties of these nuclei. So understanding how they interact, how they form, how the protons and neutrons arrange themselves and developing mathematical models. But more recently, I've become interested in this new field of research called quantum biology. Uh, physicists and chemists, we know we, we use quantum mechanics a lot, but biology, biologists tend not to use quantum mechanics. So we've become interested in looking for uh, phenomena, mechanisms inside living organisms, inside living cells, uh, down at the level of molecules, 
which require a quantum explanation. So our most recent research with my, with my students and my, my colleagues is to understand, for example, in DNA, the, the two strands, the double helix strands of DNA, they're twisted around. They're held together by particles, by protons. Uh, these are called hydrogen bonds. And those protons can quantum jump from one strand to the other. So we're developing mathematical models to try and understand if quantum mechanics is important in this process. Because if a proton jumps from one strand to the other and then they separate, that could lead to a mutation. And of course, we all know about the, the importance of mutations now with the, with the, the, the COVID virus and, and, uh, and it's a bad thing when it mutates. But of course, mutations are also good things because mutations, without mutations, there will be no evolution. We would, there will be no change. So trying to understand if quantum mechanics plays a role in mutations is a fascinating subject. So I'm now moving more into developing what are called open quantum systems, how quantum mechanics uh, behaves, how uh, quantum systems behave inside a living cell. Yeah, if I may add to that, I, oh, I'm really surprised like how much life really used all the resources available mm. to make life. Like, like the universe used all the resources to make yeah. life. Yeah. And you wouldn't expect in the first instance that quantum mechanics would be so important, but it is because it seems that the universe tried that. Nuclear physics, mm. if you look at nuclear physics, you also find resources which were used to make life. Yes, yes, it's, it's, it'd, be, it'd be very, very surprising if uh, over three and a half billion years, life didn't make use of some of the tricks of the quantum world, if that gave it an advantage. It shouldn't be surprising. <laughs> exactly, yes. Gina? Uh, yes, I, I have just received the question from uh, right now from the Facebook, and the question is uh, the following. Does time flow backwards inside black holes? Does time flow backwards? Uh, no. Um, time always, you know, wherever you are, whether you're out, outside in the universe or even it falling inside a black hole, time always goes by normally. We call it this the proper time. It's only when you compare a, one clock, say in one inside a black hole with a clock outside a black hole, T that's when times flow at a different rate. But time can never go backwards it always goes goes forward inside the black hole it's it's very difficult to tr to really imagine what is actually going on because space and time gets twisted around and and the for example the direction the radial direction towards the singularity the center of the black hole is actually it actually becomes a direction in time it's it, it, at least it helps explain why it's inevitable that you will reach the singularity in the same way that it's inevitable that you will reach tomorrow. <laughs> you know, time has to go from past to future. You have to fall towards a singularity. So time always goes forward, but it goes forward at different rates depending on your you know where you are in the universe. Yeah, you make it look, you know, look. Um, I don't know. Uh, a little bit poetic because tomorrow you will not be here with us so we will miss you tomorrow <laughs> I'll, I'll have fallen to the singularity <laughs> uh, Daniela wonders because you really certainly meet big personalities in physics uh, can you tell us some stories about the big personalities in physics you met like how they were how do they behave or some stories about you know the big personalities in physics you met well, and I've uh, for many years now, for almost ten years, I've uh, presented a radio program on on the BBC in the UK called the Life Scientific, where I interview other scientists. So not just physicists, but all, all other scientists. But if I think of you know some of the the, the really great physicists uh, you know who are alive today, I've had a chance to to, to discuss their their work with them. Um, one one lovely example is Peter Higgs. You know, who, who uh, after whom the, the Higgs boson is named. So he won his Nobel Prize uh, after the Higgs boson was confirmed uh, nine years ago because he had predicted that it existed since the 1960s. And I remember he, he, he's a very modest, 
gentle, you know, quiet man, very, very, very easy to, you know, he doesn't have an ego, very easy to talk to. But I asked him a question because this was radio for the general public. I said, could you explain what, what the Higgs boson is in 30 seconds? And he looked at me and he said, no. <laughs> oh dear, this is, this is a radio. Luckily it's not live radio. So, you know, my, I have a producer who will edit things out. So I was thinking this will just be cut. I said, okay, can you explain the Higgs boson in one minute? No. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, he, 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 he began to explain it, but it, he took maybe three, four, five minutes and I could understand what he was saying, but I was thinking, actually, this is still very complicated. Uh, and, and, but then he gave this wonderful explanation. He said, why would you expect me to be able to explain something as difficult? I've been thinking about this for half a century. This is very, very advanced mathematics, theoretical physics. It's impossible. He said some things in science are just difficult. We, we can't always simplify. We can't always make something very simple. So I thought that was a very nice way of saying, you know, that he couldn't, he couldn't explain it more simply. And it reminded me of one of the most famous physicists of the 20th century, Richard Feynman, because Feynman also, he was asked by a journalist after he won his Nobel Prize, he had, he had played a part in developing uh, a theory called quantum electrodynamics, and he won his Nobel Prize for that. And a journalist asked him if he could provide just one sentence, we, we call it a sound bite, just one sentence explaining why he won the Nobel Prize. And apparently Feynman replied, young man, if I could explain what I won my Nobel Prize for in one sentence, then the work would not have been worth a Nobel Prize. <laughs> so it was a very, very nice ex explanation of that. So I never met Richard Feynman. Um, I've, I've met s several other big, big physicists. Uh, I never, one, my hero uh, probably was the Danish physicist Niels Bohr. But sadly, he died the same year that I was born in 1962. So I never met him. But I did get to work with his last scientific assistant, Jens Bong. He, he's a, um, a Danish physicist, a nuclear physicist, and we work together and we publish papers together. So I feel through Jens, I somehow had some connection with, with, with Niels Bohr. <laughs> but, in a sense, uh, yes. In, in a sense. Close to him. Yeah, yeah. Very nice. And through you, we are also close to him now. Exactly. One, one more, one more, one step more layer. Removed, but that's fine. <laughs> one, one more degree of separation is we usually. We, 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 ah, but we will say it's still close. It's still close. Yeah. <laughs> yes, Gina. Uh, I would add a question from Dino. Will we be able to know or understand everything? Um, I, I don't think so. Um. I've, I wrote a book, a more recent book last year called The World According to Physics. I hope one day it'll be translated into Romanian. Um, and I begin that book by saying our um, knowledge of the universe, our knowledge of reality is like an island. Um, and and uh, writing a popular science book maybe is, some, is like an exploration of this island. But beyond the island is, is the, the ocean, the ocean of the unknown. And as we learn more, the area of the island increases, it expands out into the water. But we don't know if that ocean of the unknown goes on forever. We don't know if there will be a day when we will, we will know, <clears throat> excuse me, when we will know everything. Um, so far, yes, we are learning more. We have learned so much, we have understood so much, but we still keep finding more layers of the onion Think about peeling an onion, there's another layer beneath it, another layer. You know, we, we, we discovered that matter is made of atoms. Atoms are made of electrons and nuclei. Nuclei are made of protons and neutrons. Protons and neutrons are made of quarks. Are quarks ultimately made of vibrating strings in superstring theory? We don't know if we've reached the end and we, and we still have mysteries. I, I, there's a wonderful um, article that was published by, uh, um, was written by Stephen Hawking in 1980 or 1981, so about four, four decades ago, 
in which he asked, is the end of physics coming? Are we almost at the end? Do we know everything? Because he was feeling very optimistic that maybe we would discover uh, what we call the theory of everything, the theory of quantum gravity. Um, and it turns out he was wrong because, you know, since then we have discovered so many things that we don't understand, dark matter and dark energy and, and where is all the antimatter and was there something before the Big Bang? Is there one universe or many universes? All these questions are still there and hopefully one day we will answer them, but I suspect that will just lead to more questions. And I hope that will lead to more questions. I, want, I don't want to know everything. That life would be boring if we had all the answers. We want some mystery. <laughs> And if we have all the answers, there are no physicists anymore. Also, <laughs> yes, we, we won't have a job. Exactly. <laughs> we will be jobless. <laughs> yes, exactly. <laughs> About exploring this island, Marianne saw uh, uh, your BBC series, uh, Science and Islam. Mm. And he was fascinated by it. By it. But uh, he wants you to give us a feeling about the effort BBC put into this series. You know, what was the total budget? How many people were involved? How did you collaborate? Can you give us a feeling about the effort to make such a good series? Yes, I mean, th th that series and others that I've made for the BBC, I've made for one of the BBC channels called BBC Four. Now, BBC One is the big, the main BBC channel with all the, you know, the big uh, dramas, soap operas, you know, the, 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 the football, if it's very important, the, the, the sort of all the, the reality TV things. Then there's BBC Two, which has a bit, a little bit of more intellectual sort of level. You know, David Attenborough, for example, his programs and natural history will be on BBC Two. BBC Four is very much for documentaries in science and history and art and so on, which is good, but it also means BBC Four has a smaller budget than BBC One or BBC Two. So my, my, my good friend, uh, Brian Cox, who you, you're probably um, we also know aware of, we you know him. him yeah. um, uh, he's made some wonderful documentaries for BBC Two, which has a bigger budget. So he gets to go all over the world. You know, I'm standing in Antarctica, <laughs> and look at the stars, and I'm standing in Chile, I'm standing in Iceland. And they think, oh, Brian, you, you go over. For BBC Four, the budgets are, are lower. I would say, Typically for a BBC Four one hour documentary, probably something like a hundred thousand pounds. But remember this has to last for many months because it has to pay a team, directors, producer, cameraman, editor, presenter, the travel and everything like that. So that's actually a very cheap budget compared with some of the things on big TV channels, many millions of pounds would, would, would spend them. For Science and Islam, it was actually a very small team. You know, we traveled around the Middle East to Syria and Iran and, uh, and uh, North Africa and Egypt. Um, but it was just me, my cameraman and my producer director. So the, the producer director, <laughs> see both two jobs already, was also doing the sound. So it, was, it was the three of us. He was handy. He, yeah, he, he had to he had to multitask. He had to do anything. So I mean, it was great because the the two guys, the 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 producer director Tim Osborne and the cameraman Andy Jackson, are still very good friends of mine, and we've worked together since then. And in fact, we're hoping to make a, a new documentary later this year, working together again. So for us, it's like you know the boys getting back together, you know, for a for a trip like a road trip of, of friends. We don't think about it as work. We think about it almost like a holiday. Yeah. So, so it was a wonderful, wonderful experience. It was a small budget, small team, but you know, fantastic to see the things we saw, to go to the places we went to uh, was, was amazing. That may be curious. Uh, was the script written before you went there? Mostly. Yes, yes, it has to be. It has to be more or less written uh, so that we know we need to tell this story. We we need to to talk about this particular Islamic scholar. Therefore, we need to travel to that place. Yes, yes. Uh, so we 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 knew what we wanted to, and and I don't didn't write that script. So I, I mean, although I had collaborated with my with the producer um, in writing putting the script together, he was developing it because he would know 
what would work on TV, what wouldn't, what sort of things we can do, what could the budget allow. But then when we arrive there and I have to describe something, that's when I can talk to him about exactly what I want to say. Mm-hmm. And, and we so we can fine tune the script on location. But in general, we know roughly what we're going to be talking about. Yes, great, nice story. Yes, Gina? Uh, a question from uh, Sabine, let me address you. Uh, when and how uh, do you consider uh, that we human being uh, could travel uh, back in time or maybe in future? Traveling back in time is, uh, many physicists would say, probably let's, let's give up on that possibility. Maybe, you know, we, we should always never be so arrogant as to assume that what we think now is impossible will always be impossible. Because, you know, what the technology that we have built on the science that we know now would seem like magic to someone a few hundred years ago. So we don't know how much we will be able to advance. And, you know, science fiction writers are very good at imagining futures. So science fiction writers are very, you know, they can tell us the possibility of time travel. So I think provided we don't break any laws of physics, we can't rule out time travel into the past completely. It requires certain conditions, uh, properties of the universe, but it's not impossible, just very improbable. Time travel into the future, of course, is possible because all you need to do is slow time down. In in the example where I talked about uh, the film Interstellar, or Matthew McConaughey, he's 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 traveling into the future, but his time is running at a slower rate than back on Earth. So, for all intents and purposes, when he goes and visits the black hole and comes back home, he has time traveled into the future. The difference is, of course, that did doesn't. Saying we can time travel in this, into the future doesn't require the future to be out there predetermined and waiting for us. But then that, that becomes questions of philosophy. You know, does all times coexist? Is the universe deterministic? Do we have free will? The free will is a wonderful thing. You know, going back in time, you know, you, immediately you, you encounter this problem. Can you go back in time? And, and, and do something that you don't want to. Can you go back in time and kill your younger self? Well, if you do, then you never grow up to become a time traveling murderer. So it's impossible. So somehow it, it controls what you are able or not able to do. And we don't understand how that would be possible. So most physicists say, that's, 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 that's too much of a problem. Let us, let us say that time travel into the past is impossible because that makes life easier, <laughs> philosophically. <laughs> Yeah, going along this line of uh, questions difficult to answer, Mihai is fascinating about the Kardashev scale of organizing civilization, scale one, type two civilization, you know, mm. all the energy from the star, type three, and then type four, all the energy in the cluster of galaxies. What do you think about this order? He wants to know if you think it's realistic. And do you think that humanity can ever reach type four? That means controlling more galaxies. It doesn't break any laws of physics, these, these, these different levels of, of knowledge and technology and advancement. Um, and, and therefore, it's, it's possible. But we are now looking so far into the future that it just becomes very, very difficult to, to predict. Um, if you read science fiction books or watch science fiction movies about the near future, then they can maybe just extrapolate a little bit from the science that we have today. So, so it's, it's possible. You can imagine, you know, quantum entanglement, or you can imagine uh, uh, some ideas about invisibility cloaks or technology that is, that is feasible. But when you get to the point where we populate the galaxy, we can control energy and masses at the level of planets and stars, it's not impossible because the laws of physics, you know, don't rule it out, but it's so far removed from what we're doing now that it's very difficult to imagine. Of course, if there's life elsewhere, then who's to say how long that life has existed and how advanced it is. It would be incredibly improbable if there is life, intelligent life elsewhere in the galaxy that is at the same level of, of, of technological 
knowledge or, or, uh, that we are. And we've only been developing our technologies for a few millennia. And therefore, in, in a sense, we're at the very beginning of the journey. So provided humanity can survive and evolve into something that's probably not human, then thousands of years from now, uh, anything's possible. I... Oh, you're, you're, you're muted, Christian. Yes, I like the way you said we are at the beginning of the journey. We're in the childhood of civilization. Mm. That makes me feel good because I reached 50 years <laughs> last month. <laughs> but I still You're still at the beginning of your because journey. Because we are at the beginning of civilization. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> yes. Gina? So uh, I would like to think back uh, to subatomic particles. Um, we know that uh, we have uh, cosmic rays, if we look at the ultra high energy cosmic rays that uh, might be accelerated uh, by a black hole. And the question might be how a black hole may uh, emit particles at such uh, high energies which would re reach us uh, on Earth, considering that a uh, black hole only absorbs matter but doesn't emit matter. So. Uh, we consider this uh, as um, black uh, as um, uh, source candidate for emitting ultra high energy uh, particles. Uh, so, question is how a black hole may uh, accelerate a particle to such energies? And uh, other question related to these particles might be. We know that uh, we have uh, muons, which also travel to, to the ground, uh, which are produced in extensive showers uh, in the Earth atmosphere. So they reach us on ground, um, considering uh, that uh, they, uh, they, they spend um, such a large distance in a low time. So here mm. is the, the, the time dilation and the... Uh, yeah. Uh, uh, um, distance. Um, um, it's, it's yes, it's, it's, it's contracted. Yes, yes, yeah. Contracted I, distance. I'll, I'll I'll answer that first. First, um, the second question first, because that that that's fun. Yes, the the these these particles, these muons, we know if they're not moving, they have a certain lifetime. So it's like two microseconds or milliseconds. Yes. I can't. Is, is two, it, two microseconds. Two, mi two microseconds. So two millionths of a second is, is their lifetime. Not exactly, but on average, that's how long they would live before they decay and change into something else. But we also know they're created, as you say, in the upper atmosphere and the distance they have to travel. If we measure the time it takes for them to travel from the top to our detectors on the ground, it's much longer than two microseconds. So how come they lived so long to be able to arrive on, on the ground? And that's because of Einstein's theory of relativity, which says, which, which is his first theory, his special theory, not the one that we were talking about earlier about gravity slowing time down. This is not about gravity slowing time down. This is about traveling very fast, uh, close to the speed of light, time runs at a different rate for them. So for us, when we see them, if each muon had a little clock as it was flying down to the ground, we would see that clock ticking by more slowly than the clock on Earth. And when it reached the Earth, it would count less than two microseconds. That's why it survived, because its time is running slower. But from the muon's point of view, if it had eyes, particles don't have eyes, but if it could see, it would also see the distance that it is required to travel is shortened is length contracted so it says of course i can get to the ground in less than two microseconds look i only have to travel a short distance it's a shorter distance than you on the ground see it so distances and times change depending on on, on our speed so this this wonderful example and people you know even students do this experiments in, in university laboratories but in terms of black holes well most of the cosmic rays, of course, that we that arrive on Earth don't come from black holes. They come from the sun. They come from other uh, other parts of, of the universe. Objects that can very easily and very happily emit high energy particles out into out into space. But you know, something that Stephen Hawking predicted back in the 1970s is that black holes can also emit particles. But there's a special mechanism required for this to happen. 
and, and this is called Hawking radiation, because nothing can come from inside the black hole, from inside the event horizon and, and, and go out. So these particles are actually created outside of the event horizon of the black hole. And sometimes what could happen is that one of them falls into the black hole and the other one manages to escape. So it's possible that a particle that has escaped, that was created outside a black hole and has escaped from the black hole, carrying some of the energy of the black hole with it can, can arrive on earth. But I suspect that would be a very rare event from all the cosmic ray particles that we encounter, say this one came from a black hole, that would be very uh, small probability. Yes, indeed. Uh, I would like to remind our readers that we are here with Jim Al-Khalili, who wrote this very nice book and was translated in uh, Romanian. Gina, you can show your book as well. <laughs> you know, <laughs> great enough for the picture, Jim. <laughs> it was really, really a pleasure uh, to have you here. We have like a few more minutes. So if you allow me, I will put one question, maybe two. Gina, maybe you put your last question and then we will ask Jim to you know, say something about for Romanian readers, for the young uh, people who follow you. Uh, and the question I have is from Gabi, who wants to know how does uh, an ideal physics classroom room, uh, look for you, from, for you? I mean, if you want, if you would be a teacher and if you would have, you know, all the money in the world, and you have to give physics lessons. Uh, how would a classroom in physics look? Wow, um, well, I, I'm, I was reminded of how a classroom shouldn't look during the during the pandemic when I've had to go and teach my university students. Uh, of course, you know I'm wearing a mask, they're wearing masks, and it's a very you know you can when you can just see the eyes and they're not speaking to each other, and it was a very um, strange environment uh, because. The, the tutorial classes that I give at university, I expect the students to talk to each other. So for me, an, an, an ideal classroom is, is very simple. It's one in which the, the, the students are not only asking, listening to, to, to me as their teacher or asking me questions, but asking each other questions, talking to each other, um, sharing their problems with each other, sharing, you know, the, the solutions to equations. I, I got 6.3, what did you get? You know, if they're, if they're solving a problem, having a general discussion and, and for the students to be not just curious, but excited by what they're learning, that, that, that's a wonderful thing to happen. And it, it doesn't happen all the time, of course. And, and not every lesson or lecture in physics is exciting, <laughs> but, to get people talking and asking questions and, and, and starting, you know, you can see in their eyes when they begin to understand something. And, and that's when you want to keep that curiosity burning. And I think that if one of the students go to sleep and when they sleep, they still think about the problem in the then day. Fine. Then fine, <laughs> then it's okay, I don't, I don't mind. <laughs> but if they're just because then they you were- your goal. <laughs> but if they were in the bar last night and they didn't have much sleep because they had too much beer, that's a different problem. <laughs> <laughs> yes, Gina? I would come to, to light. A light, it's a very important uh, ingredient in the, in the universe. So we know that there is no particle uh, which could uh, exceed the speed of light. A uh, photon is uh, having the speed of light. Uh, and we know that we have uh, electrons which can uh, exceed the speed of light in water in a different medium, which is very fa fascinating, uh, generating the so-called uh, Cherenkov radiation. Uh, it's a method mm. that we, uh, we, we use to uh, measure um, uh, particles from uh, air showers, cosmic ray induced air showers. So um, would you expect uh, that uh, in the future, uh, physicists would, be, uh, would, uh, would find soon uh, any other new particle uh, or a new particle uh, which would exceed the, the speed of light? If, if you're asking a particle that, that would exceed the speed of light in a vacuum, in a vacuum. Then, then if Einstein is correct, and we, we think he is, then I would have to say no. 
Uh, some years ago, there was the possibility, I guess you, you will both uh, be familiar with it, when the, 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 it was the thought that uh, the Grand Sasso experiment, they thought they had discovered these particles called neutrinos traveling faster than the speed of light. And most physicists said, no, I don't believe it. You know, go and check, check the experiment again. And many people in the public saying, why are these physicists being so arrogant? You say nothing can go faster than light, now we discover that these particles can. You have to change your minds. But in fact, we are so confident that there is no possibility of anything exceeding. Because the speed of light, it's not light that is special. It's the speed that is special. It's a property of our space time. It's a property of our universe. It just happens that light, because it's made of massless particles, photons, it is able to travel at this maximum speed limit but it, it's impossible to go far, uh, faster. And these, these experiments, in the end, they discovered there was some faulty cable uh, in one of their um, instruments that wasn't plugged in correctly. And when they pushed it in, suddenly these neutrinos were not traveling at, uh, faster than light. They're traveling a little bit slower than light. So yeah, that's a long answer to say, no, I don't think we will ever find particles faster than light. <laughs> yes. Uh, before Jim, I will let you just give some final words. I will just say two things in Romanian for uh, for the readers. It takes like takes less than a minute. Dragi uh, prieteni, tocmai am stat de vorbă cu Jim Alcalili, pe care îl cunoaștem foarte mult de la BBC, din emisiunile pe care le face. O carte a lui, Găuri negre, găuri de vierme și călătorie în timp, tocmai a fost tradusă la editora Humanitas. Este o carte care se citește ușor, este făcută pentru omul de rând, nu trebuie să ai cunoștințe mari de fizică, să înțelegi puțin din cum funcționează găurile, de ne găurile negre, găurile de vierme și mai ales călătoria în timp. Este posibilă sau nu este posibilă? Vă spun o șmecherie din carte. Are o, un exemplu prin care, cine știe, putem să călătorim înapoi în timp. Vă las să-l descoperiți. Thank you very much, Jim, for your patience and mostly for really the nice time you spent with us. It was a very, very nice evening from us. Uh, maybe, Gina, you want to say first few words and then Jim will close the evening. Yes, uh, it was really a great pleasure to join uh, you uh, this nice evening. Uh, and it was a great pleasure to read the book and to... Um, Uh, enjoy the, the travel in space, back in time and uh, towards the future. It's really a brilliant way how to uh, put in words, uh, friendly words, this kind of uh, physics which somehow can be heavy. Uh, so it's really enjoyable. So uh, I congratulate you for writing uh, this book, very useful for us. Also as a physicist, um, as a hint how to um, translate uh, sometimes uh, some uh, difficult message uh, to, to the audience, to the general public. So it was really a great uh, pleasure. So thank you very much for giving me this opportunity. Oh, well, well, thank you very much. Thank you, both of you, for, for a, a nice discussion. It's, uh, it's a shame we can't do this in person. Hopefully, you know, sometime, sometime soon, when all the, the pandemic is over, I can come and visit Romania and, and, and maybe speak to people in, in person. I, I, the book itself was a wonderful, as I mentioned, it was my first book that I wrote, but it was the one that gave me most pleasure because it's talking about subjects that I think everybody finds fascinating and exciting. You know, we, we communicate science for many reasons. We, we know, for example, even now during the pandemic, the importance of communicating science and the scientific method the importance of evidence and data, the importance of, of uncertainty in science, not being arrogant, being prepared to change your mind, listen to experts. So all those things are important. But ultimately, I think having a fascination about our universe and our place in the universe, I think that defines our humanity. We will always have that fascination. And what I've tried to do in the book is explain what we know and explain what we don't know, uh, but putting it in a way that I, I hope everyone can feel that same enthusiasm and passion for, for physics that we as physicists, you know, this is why we do what we do because we find it exciting. I want everyone to appreciate. I always say, how can, why isn't everybody in love with physics? That's, you, know, you should all be in love with physics. <laughs> I hope this book helps convince a few more people. 
<laughs> for sure. <laughs> Thank you very much for Jim. And for sure, if you ever do a new, do a, a new series, and it may happen that you want to film in Bucharest, you are more than welcome to come to the Humanitas place, and then we will meet you. Fantastic. Thank you very much I again for, for the nice evening, Gina. Mulțumesc Thank foarte you. mult. Thank you, Christian. Mulțumesc. Thank you very Till much indeed. Till next time. See you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.